This video will contain tablets 9 through 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, translated by Andrew George. Tablet 9, The Wanderings of Gilgamesh. In mourning for Enkidu, whose death has brought home to him his own mortality, Gilgamesh leaves Uruk to wander the earth in search of the immortal Utnapishti, whose secret he covets. Pressing on to the end of the world, he comes to the mountains where the sun sets and rises and asks the help of the scorpion man who guards the way under the mountains. Unable to convince Gilgamesh of the danger he courts, the scorpion man allows him to pass, and Gilgamesh races against time to complete the path of the sun before the sun can catch up with him. He reaches the far end of the tunnel just in time and finds himself in a garden of jewels. For his friend Enkidu Gilgamesh did bitterly weep as he wandered the wild. I shall die, and shall I not then be as Enkidu? Sorrow has entered my heart. I am afraid of death, so I wander the wild to find Utanapishti, son of Ubar Tutu. On the road traveling swiftly, I came one night to a mountain pass. I saw some lions and grew afraid. I lifted my head to the moon in prayer. To sin, the lamp of the gods went my supplications. O oh, sin, and keep me safe. That night he lay down, then woke from a dream. In the presence of the moon, he grew glad of life. He took up his axe in his hand. He drew forth the dirk from his belt. Like an arrow among them, he fell. He smote the lions, he killed them and scattered them. The lacuna that intervenes here can be filled in part from the text from an old Babylonian tablet, reportedly from Sippar. He clad himself in their skin, he ate their flesh. Gilgamesh dug wells that had never existed before. He drank the water and he changed the winds. Shamash grew worried and bending down, he spoke to Gilgamesh. Oh, Gilgamesh, where are you wandering? The life that you seek, you never will find, said Gilgamesh to him, to the hero Shamash. After roaming, wandering all through the wild, when I enter the netherworld will rest be scarce, I shall lie there sleeping all down the years. Let my eyes see the sun and be sated with light. The darkness is hidden, how much light is there left? When may the dead see the rays of the sun? The text of Tablet 9 resumes. To Machu's twin mountains he came, which daily guard the rising sun, whose tops support the fabric of heaven, whose base reaches down to the netherworld. There were scorpion men guarding his gate, whose terror was dread, whose glance was death, whose radiance was fearful, overwhelming the mountains. At sunrise and sunset, they guarded the sun. Gilgamesh saw them in fear and dread. He covered his face. Then he collected his wits and drew near their presence. The scorpion man called to his mate. He who has come to us, flesh of the gods, is his body. The scorpion's mate answered him. Two thirds of him is God and one third human. The scorpion man called out, saying a word to King Gilgamesh, flesh of the gods. How did you come here, such a far road? How did you get here to be in my presence? How did you cross the seas whose passage is perilous? Let me learn of your journey. Where your face is turned, let me learn of your journey. When the text resumes after a lacuna, Gilgamesh is explaining his quest. I am seeking the road of my forefather, Utindapishti, who attended the God's assembly and found life eternal. Of death and light, he shall tell me the secret. The scorpion man opened his mouth to speak, saying to Gilgamesh, Never before, O Gilgamesh, was there one like you. Never did anyone travel the path of the mountain. For twelve double hours its interior extends. The darkness is dense and the light is there none. For the rising of the sun, for the setting of the sun, for the setting of the they send forth. And you, how will you, will you go in? After a long lacuna, the text resumes with the end of Gilgamesh's reply. Through sorrow, by frost and by sunshine, my face is burnt. Through exhaustion, now you... The scorpion man opened his mouth to speak, saying a word to Gilgamesh, flesh of the gods. Go, Gilgamesh, may the mountains of Mashu allow you to pass. May the mountains and hills watch over your going. Let them help you in safety to continue your journey. May the gate of the mountains open before you. Gilgamesh heard these words. What the scorpion man told him he took to heart. He took the path of the sun god. At one double hour, the darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. At two double hours, the darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. At three double hours, the darkness was dense and light there was none. It did not allow him to see behind him. At four double hours, the darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. At five double hours, the darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. On reaching six double hours, the darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. On reaching seven double hours, the darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. At eight double hours, he was hurrying. 
The darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. At nine double hours, the north wind his face. The darkness was dense and light was there none. It did not allow him to see behind him. On reaching 10 double hours was very near. On reaching 11 double hours, a journey remained of one double hour. At 12 double hours, Gilgamesh came out in advance of the sun. There was brilliance. He went straight, as soon as he saw them, to the trees of the gods. A carnelian tree was in fruit, hung with bunches of grapes, lovely to look on. A lapis lazuli tree bore foliage, in full fruit and gorgeous to gaze on. Cypress, cedar. Its leaf stems were of papadillu stone and sea coral sasu stone. Instead of thorns and briars, there grew stone vials. He touched a carob. It was a basmu stone, agate, and hymatite. As Gilgamesh walked about, she lifted her head in order to watch him. Tablet 10, At the Edge of the World. Beyond the garden by the seashore, there lives a wise old goddess. She spies a forbidding figure in the distance and taking him to be a hunter bars the door of her tavern. Gilgamesh hears her and threatens to break in. She asks who he is. He tells her how his friend has died and how much he now fears death, and he asks her aid in crossing the sea to find Utnapishti. She warns him of the futility of his quest and the dangers of the waters of death, but at length tells him where to find Utnapishti's ferryman, Ur Shanabi, with his crew of stone ones. Gilgamesh rushes down on the ferryman and his strange companions. When the fighting is over, he explains his quest to Ur Shanabi and asks his aid in fighting, finding Utnapishti. Ur Shanabi reveals that Gilgamesh has hindered his own progress by smashing the stone ones but he instructs Gilgamesh to make punting poles of immense length as an alternative means of propulsion. They embark on the boat with the poles. When the poles are all gone, Gilgamesh uses the ferryman's garment to make a sail, and they cross the waters of death. Having landed, Gilgamesh tells his story to Utnapishti. Utnapishti reminds him of the duties of a king and discourses on the inevitability of death and the fleeting nature of life. Chiduri was a tavern keeper who lived by the seashore. There she dwelt in an inn by the seashore. Pot stands she had and vats all of gold. She was swathed in hoods and veiled with veils. Gilgamesh came wandering. He was clad in a pelt and fearful to look on, the flesh of the gods he had in his body. But in his heart there was sorrow. His face resembled one come from afar as the tavern keeper watched him in the distance. Talking to herself, she spoke a word, taking counsel in her own mind. For sure, this man is a hunter of wild bulls, but where does he come from, making straight for my gate? Thus the tavern keeper saw him and barred her gate, barred her gate and went up on the roof. But Gilgamesh gave ear to, he lifted his chin and turned towards her. Said Gilgamesh to her, to the tavern keeper, tavern keeper, why did you bar your gate as soon as you saw me? You barred your gate and went up on the roof. I will smash down the doors. I shall shatter the bolts. Said the tavern keeper to him, to Gilgamesh, I barred my gate. I went up on my roof. Let me learn of your journey. Said Gilgamesh to her, to the tavern keeper. My friend Enkidu and I, having joined forces, we climbed the mountain, seized and slew the bull of heaven, destroyed whom Baba who dwelt in the forest of cedar, killed lions in the mountain passes. Said the tavern keeper to him, to Gilgamesh, if you and Enkidu were the ones who slew the guardian, destroyed whom Baba who dwelt in the forest of cedar, killed lions in the mountain passes, seized and slew the bull come down from the heavens, why are your cheeks so hollow, your face so sunken, your mood so wretched, your visage so wasted? Why in your heart does sorrow reside and your face resemble one come from afar? Why are your features burnt by frost and by sunshine? And why do you wander the wild and lion's garb? Said Gilgamesh to her, to the tavern keeper. Why should my cheeks not be hollow, my face not sunken, my mood not wretched, my visage not wasted? Should not sorrow reside in my heart and my face not resemble one come from afar? Should not my features be burnt by frost and by sunshine? And should I not wander the wild and lion's garb? My friend, a wild ass on the run, donkey of the uplands, panther of the wild. My friend, Enkidu, a wild ass on the run, donkey of the uplands, panther of the wild. My friend, whom I love so dear, who with me went through every danger. My friend, Enkidu, who I love so dear, who with me went through every danger. The doom of mortals overtook him. Six days I wept for him and seven nights. I did not surrender his body for burial until a maggot dropped from his nostril. Then I was afraid that I too would die. I grew fearful of death and so death and so wander the wild. What became of my friend was too much to bear. So on a far road I wander the wild. What became of my friend and Kadu was too much to bear. So on a far path I wander the wild. How can I keep silent? How can I stay silent? My friend whom I love has turned to clay. My friend and Kadu whom I loved has turned to clay. Shall I not be like him and also lie down, never to rise again through all eternity? 
said Gilgamesh to her, to the tavern keeper. Now, O tavern keeper, where is the road to Utnapishti? What is its landmark? Tell me. Give me its landmark. If I may be done, I will cross the ocean. If it may not be done, I will wander the wild, said the tavern keeper to him, to Gilgamesh. Oh, Gilgamesh, there never has been a way across, nor since olden days can anyone cross the ocean. Only Shamash the hero crosses the ocean apart from the sun god who crosses the ocean. The crossing is perilous, its way full of hazard, and midway lies the water of death, blocking the passage forward. So beside, Gilgamesh, once you have crossed the ocean, when you reach the waters of death, what then will you do? Gilgamesh, there is ur Shinabi, the boatman of Utanapishti, and the stone ones are with him as he picks a pine clean in the midst of the forest. Go then, let him see your face. If it may be done, go across with them. If it may not be done, turn around and go back. Gilgamesh heard these words. He took up his axe in his hand. He drew forth the dirt from his belt. Forward he crept, and on them he rushed down. Like an arrow he fell among them. In the midst of the forest, his shout resounded. Urshanabi saw the bright. He took up an axe, and he, him. But he, Gilgamesh, struck his head. He seized his arms and pinned him down. They took fright, the stone ones who crewed the boat, who were not harmed by the waters of death. The wide ocean at the waters. He stayed not his hand. He smashed them in his fury. He threw them in the river. What happens next is best preserved in the old Babylonian tablet, reportedly from Sippar. He came back, stand over them. As Urshanabi looked him in the eye, said Urshanabi to him, to Gilgamesh, tell me, what is your name? I am Urshanabi of Utnapishti, the distant, said Gilgamesh to him, to Urshanabi. Gilgamesh, there is Urshanabi, the boatman of Utnapishti, and the stone ones are with him as he picks a pine clean in the forest of Gilgamesh is my name, who came from Uruk Ayana, who wound away around the mountains. The hidden road, there rises the sun. The text of Tablet 10 resumes. Said Urshanabi to him, to Gilgamesh, why are your cheeks so hollow, your face so wait sunken, your mood so wretched, your visage so wasted? Why in your heart does sorrow reside, and your face resemble one come from afar? Why are your features burnt by frost and by sunshine, and why do you wander the wild and lion's garb? Said Gilgamesh to him, to the boatman of Urshanabi. Why should my cheeks not be hollow, my face not sunken, my mood not wretched, my visage not wasted? Should not sorrow reside in my heart, and my face not resemble one come from afar? Should not my features be burnt by frost and by sunshine, and should I not wander the wild in lion's garb? My friend, a wild ass on the run, donkey of the uplands, panther of the wild, my friend, Enkidu, a wild ass on the run, donkey of the uplands, panther of the wild, having joined forces, we climbed the mountains, seized and slew the bull of heaven. Destroyed whom Baba, who dwelt in the forest of cedar, killed lions in the mountain passes. My friend, whom I love so dear, who with me went through every danger. My friend Enkidu, whom I loved so dear, who with me went through every danger. The doom of mortals overtook him. Six days I wept for him and seven nights. I did not surrender his body for burial until a maggot dropped from his nostril. Then I was afraid that I too would die. I grew fearful of death and so wander the wild. What became of my friend was too much to bear. So on a far road, I wander the wild. What became of my friend Enkidu was too much to bear. So on a far path, I wander the wild. How can I keep silent? How can I stay quiet? My friend whom I loved has turned to clay. My friend Enkidu whom I loved has turned to clay. Shall I not be like him and also lie down, never to rise again through all eternity? Said Gilgamesh to him, to ur Shanabi, the boatman. Now ur Shanabi, where is the road to Utnapishti? What is its landmark? Tell me. Give me its landmark. If I may be done, I will cross the ocean. If it may be not be done, I will wander the wild. Said Urshanabi to him, to Gilgamesh, your own hands, O Gilgamesh, have prevented your crossing. You smashed the stone ones through them into the river. The stone ones are smashed and the pine is not stripped. Take up, O Gilgamesh, your axe in your hand. Go down to the forest and cut 300 punting poles, each five rods in length. Trim them and furnish them each with a boss. Then bring them here into my presence. Gilgamesh heard these words. He took up his axe in his hand. He drew forth the dirk from his belt. He went down to the forest and cut 300 hunting poles, each five rods in length. He trimmed them and furnished them each with a boss. Then he brought them to Urshanabi, the boatman. Gilgamesh and Urshanabi crewed the boat. They launched the craft and crewed it themselves. In three days, they made a journey of a month and a half, and Urshanabi came to the waters of death. Said ur Shanabi to him, to Gilgamesh, set two, O Gilgamesh, take the first punting pole. Let your hand not touch the waters of death, lest you wither it. Take a second punting pole, Gilgamesh, a third and a fourth. Take a fifth punting pole, Gilgamesh, a sixth and a seventh. Take an eighth punting pole, Gilgamesh, a ninth and a tenth. Take an eleventh punting pole, Gilgamesh, and a twelfth. At a hundred 
and 20 double furlongs, Gilgamesh had used all the punting poles. So he, Urshanavi, undid his clothing. Gilgamesh stripped off his garment. With arms held aloft, he made a yard arm. Utanapishti was watching Gilgamesh in the distance. Talking to himself, he spoke a word, taking counsel in his own mind. Why are the boat's stone ones all broken and aboard it? One who is not its master. He who comes is no man of mine, but on the right I am looking, but he is no man of mine. He is not mine. The boatman, the man who, who, Gilgamesh drew near to the quayside. Said Gilgamesh to him, to Utnapishti, Utnapishti, who after the deluge, what? Said Utnapishti to him, to Gilgamesh, why are your cheeks so hollow, your face so sunken, your mood so wretched, your visage so wasted? Why in your heart does sorrow reside and your face resemble one come from afar? Why are your features burnt by frost and by sunshine and why do you wander the wild in lion's garb? Said Gilgamesh to him, to Utnapishti, why should my cheeks not be hollow, my face not sunken, my mood not wretched, my visage not wasted? Should not sorrow reside in my heart and my face not resemble one come from afar? Should not my features be burnt by frost and by sunshine? And should I not wander the wild in lion's garb? My friend, a wild ass on the run, donkey of the uplands, panther of the wild. My friend, and could do a wild ass on the run, donkey of the uplands, panther of the wild. Having seized forces, we climbed the mountains, seized and slew the bull of heaven, destroyed whom Baba, who dwelt in the forest of cedar, killed lions in the mountain passes. My friend, whom I loved so dear, who with me went through every danger. My friend, and could do whom I loved so dear, who with me went through every danger. The doom of mortals overtook him. Six days I wept for him, and seven nights I did not surrender the body for burial until a maggot dropped from his nostril. Then I was afraid that I too would die. I grew fearful of death and so wander the wild. What became of my friend was too much to bear. So on a far road, I wander the wild. What became of my friend Enkidu was too much to bear. So on a far path, I wander the wild. How can I keep silent? How can I stay quiet? My friend whom I loved has turned to clay. My friend Enkidu whom I loved has turned to clay. Shall I not be like him and also lie down, never to rise again through all eternity? Said Gilgamesh to him, to Utina Pishti. I thought... I will find Utnapishti, the distant of whom men tell, and I wandered journeying through every land. Many times I passed through terrible mountains, many times I crossed and recrossed all oceans. Of somber sweet, my face had too little. I scourged myself by going sleepless. I have filled my sinews with sorrow, and what have I achieved by my toil? I had yet to reach the tavern keeper. My clothing was worn out. I killed bear, hyena, lion, panther, cheetah, deer, ibex, the beasts, and game of the wild. I ate their flesh, their pelts I flayed. Now let the gate of sorrow be barred, let its door be sealed, tar and pitch. For my sake, they shall interrupt the dancing no more, for me, happy and carefree. Said Utnapishti to him, to Gilgamesh, why, Gilgamesh, do you ever chase sorrow? You who are built from God's flesh and human, whom the gods did fashion like father and mother. Did you ever, Gilgamesh, compare your lot with the fool? They placed a throne in the assembly and told you sit. The fool gets leftover yeast instead of fresh ghee, brain and grist instead of best flour. He is clad in a rag instead of fine garments. Instead of a belt, he is girt with old rope. Because he has no advisors to guide him, his affairs lack counsel. Have thought of him, Gilgamesh, who is their master as many as, the moon and the gods of the night. At night, the moon travels, the gods stay awake, and wakeful and sleeping from olden times is set. Now consider your support. If Gilgamesh, the temples of the gods, have no provisioner, the temples of the goddess, they, the gods, thrower, he made for a gift he, they will cast down. And Kadu, indeed, they took to his doom, but you, you toiled away, and what did you achieve? You exhaust yourself with ceaseless toil. You fill your sinews with sorrow, bringing forward the end of your days. Man is snapped off like a reed in a cane break. The comely young man, the pretty young woman, all too soon in their prime, death abducts them. No one at all sees death. No one at all sees the face of death. No one at all hears the voice of death. Death so savage who hacks men down. Ever do we build our households. Ever do we make our nests. Ever do brothers divide their inheritance. Ever do feuds arise in the land. Ever the river has risen and brought us the flood that may fly floating on the water. On the face of the sun, its countenance gazes, then all of a sudden, nothing is there. The abducted and the dead, how alike is their lot, but never was drawn the likeness of death, never in the land did the dead greet a man. The Anunnaki, the great gods, held an assembly. Mamatum, maker of destiny, fixed fates with them. Both death and life they have established, but the day of death they did not disclose. Tablet 11, Immortality Denied. 
Gilgamesh asks Utanapishti how he gained eternal life, and here's how Utanapishti survived the deluge and was given immortality by the gods as a result. Utanapishti suggests Gilgamesh go without sleep for a week. Gilgamesh fails the test and realizes in despair that he cannot beat sleep. He has no hope of conquering death. Utanapishti commands his ferrymen to give Gilgamesh to have Gilgamesh bathe and dress himself in more kingly garments and to escort him back to Uruk. Utanapishti's wife counsels him to give the departing hero the customary present for the journey. Utanapishti tells Gilgamesh how deep under the sea, a plant like coral grows that has the property of rejuvenation. Gilgamesh dives to the seabed and retrieves it. He and Urshanabi leave for Uruk. Stopping at a welcoming pool, Gilgamesh bathes in its water and a snake seizes on his in inattention to steal the precious plant. Knowing that he will never rediscover the exact spot where he died, Gilgamesh, where he dived, Gilgamesh realizes at last that all his labors have been in vain. His hopes are destroyed. It would have been better not to have met Utanapishti at all. He and Urshanabi arrive in Uruk, where, with words that echo the prologue, Gilgamesh shows the ferryman the wall that will be his enduring monument. Said Gilgamesh to him to Utanapishti the distant. I look at you, Utanapishti, your form is no different. You are just like me. You are not any different. You are just like me. I was fully intent on making you fight, but now in your presence, my hand is stayed. How was it you stood with the gods in assembly? How did you find the life eternal? Said Utanapishti to him, to Gilgamesh, let me disclose, O Gilgamesh, as a matter most secret. To you, I will disclose a mystery of the gods. The towns of Shurupak, a city well known to you, which stands on the banks of the river Euphrates, the city was old, the gods once were in it, when the great gods decided to send down the deluge. Their father, Anu, swore on oath, and their counselor, the hero, Enlo, their chamberlain, the god, Nanurta, and their sheriff, the god, Anugi. Prince Lea swore with them also, repeating the words to a fence made of reed. O oh, fence of reed, a wall of brick, hear this, O oh, fence, pay heed, O oh, wall. O man of Shurupak, son of Ubartutu, demolish the house and build a boat. Abandon wealth and seek survival, spurn property, save life. Take on board the boat of all living things, seed. The boat you will build, her dimensions shall be equal. Her length and breadth shall be the same. Cover her with a roof like the ocean below. I understood and spoke to Aya, my master. I obey, O oh master, what thus you told me. I understood and I shall do it. But how do I answer my city, the crowd and the elders? Aya opened his mouth to speak, saying to me, his servant, also you will say to them this, for sure the god Enlil feels for me hatred. In your city, I can no longer live. I can no longer, I can no more tread, sorry, I can tread no more on Enlil's ground. I must go to the ocean below to live with Aya, my master and he will send you rain of plenty. In abundance of birds, a profusion of fishes, he will provide a harvest of riches. In the morning, he will send you a shower of bread cakes, and in the evening, a torrent of wheat. At the very first glimmer of brightening dawn, at the gate of Atrahasis assembled the land, the carpenter carrying his hatchet, the reed worker carrying his stone, the shipwright bearing his heavyweight axe. The young men were, the old men bearing ropes of palm fiber, the rich man was carrying the pitch, the poor man brought the tackle. By the fifth day, I had set her hull in position. One acre was her area, 10 rods the height of her sides. At 10 rods also, the sides of her roof were each the same length. I set in place her body. I drew up her design. Six decks I gave her, dividing her thus into seven. Into nine compartments, I divided her interior. I struck the bilge plugs into her middle. I saw to the punting poles and put in the tackle. Three myriad measures of pitch I poured in a furnace. Three myriad of tar, I within. Three myriad of oil fetched the workforce of porters. Aside from the myriad of oil consumed in libations, there were two myriad of oil stowed away by the boatmen. For my workmen, I butchered oxen and lambs I slaughtered daily. Beer and ale, oil and wine, like water from a river I gave my workforce, so they enjoyed a feast like the days of New Year. At sunrise, I set my hand to the oiling. Before the sun set, the boat was complete. We're very arduous. From back to front, we moved poles for the slipway until two thirds of the boat had entered the water. Everything I owned, I loaded aboard. All the silver I owned, I loaded aboard. All the gold I owned, I loaded aboard. All the living creatures I had, I loaded aboard. I sent on board all my kith and kin, the beasts of every field, the creatures of the wild, and members of every skill and craft. The time when the sun got appointed, in the morning, he will send you a shower of bread cakes, and in the evening, a torrent of wheat. Go into the boat and seal your hatch. The time had now come. In the morning, he will send you a shower of bread cakes, and in the evening, a torrent of wheat. I examined the look of the weather. 
The weather to look at was full of foreboding. I went into the boat and sealed my hatch. To the one who sealed the boat, Pazur and Lil the shipwright, I gave my palace with all its goods. At the very first glimmer of brightening dawn, there arose on the horizon a dark cloud of black, and bellowing within it was Ada the storm god. The gods Shulat and Hanish were going before him, bearing his throne over mountain and land. The god Erakal was uprooting the mooring poles, and Inurta was passing by, made the weirs overflow. The Anunnaki gods carried torches of fire, scorching the country with brilliant flashes. The stillness of the storm god passes over the sky, and all that was bright then turned into darkness. He charged the land like a bull on the rampage. He smashed it to pieces like a vessel of clay. For a day, the gale winds flattened the country. Quickly they blew, and then came the deluge. Like a battle, the cataclysm passed over the people. One man could not discern another, nor could people be recognized amid the destruction. Even the gods took fright at the deluge. They left and went up to the heaven of Anu, lying like dogs curled up in the open. The goddess cried out like a woman in childbirth. Belit Ili wailed, whose voice is so sweet. The olden times have turned to clay because I spoke evil in the gods' assembly. How could I speak evil in the gods' assembly and declare a war to destroy my people? It is I who gave birth. These people are mine, and now, like fish, they fill the ocean. The Anunnaki gods were weeping with her. Wet faced with sorrow, they were weeping with her. Their lips were parched and stricken with fever. For six days and seven nights, there blew the wind, the downpour, the gale, the deluge, it flattened the land. But the seventh day, when it came, the gale relented, the deluge ended. The ocean grew calm that had thrashed like a woman in labor. The tempest grew still, the deluge ended. I looked at the weather, it was quiet and still, but all the people had turned to clay. The floodplain was flat like the roof of a house. I opened a vent on my cheeks, fell the sunlight. Down sat I, I knelt and I wept. Down my cheeks, the court tears were coursing. I scanned the horizons, the edge of the ocean. In 14 places, there rose an island. On the mountain of Nimush, the boat ran aground. Mount Nimush held the boat fast, allowed it no motion. One day and a second, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, allowed it no motion. A third day and a fourth, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, it allowed it no motion. A fifth day and a sixth, Mount Nimush held the boat fast, allowed it no motion. The seventh day when it came, I brought out a dove, I let it loose. Off went the dove, but then it returned. There was no place to land, so back it came to me. I brought out a swallow, I let it loose. Off went the swallow, but then it returned. There was no place to land, so back it came to me. I brought out a raven. I let it loose. Off went the raven. It saw the waters receding, finding food, bowing and bobbing. It did not come back to me. I brought out an offering to the four winds made sacrifice. Incense I placed on the peak of the mountain. Seven flasks and seven I set in position. Reed, cedar, and myrtle I piled beneath them. The gods did smell the savor. The gods did smell the savor sweet. The gods gathered like flies around the man making sacrifice. Then at once Belit Ili arrived. She lifted the flies of lapis lazuli that Anu had made for their courtship. Oh gods, let these great beads in this necklace of mine make me remember these days and never forget them. All the gods shall come to the incense, but to the incense let and will not come, because he lacked counsel and brought on the deluge and delivered my people into destruction. Then at once Enlil arrived. He saw the boat. He was seized with anger, filled with rage at the divine Igigi. From where escaped this living being? No one was meant to escape the destruction. Ninur Ninurta opened his mouth to speak, saying to the hero Enlil, Who, if not Ea, could cause such a thing? Ea alone knows how all things are done. Ea opened his mouth to speak, saying to the hero Enlil, You, the sage of the gods, the hero, how could you lack counsel and bring on the deluge? On him who transgresses, inflict his wrong. On him who does wrong, inflict his wrongdoing. Slack off, lest it snap. Pull tight, lest it slacken. Instead of your causing the deluge, a lion could have arisen and diminished the people. Instead of your causing the deluge, a wolf could have risen and diminished the people. Instead of your causing the deluge, a famine could have happened and slaughtered the land. Instead of causing the deluge, the plague god could have risen and slaughtered the land. It was not I disclosed the god's great secret. Atrahasis, I let see a vision, and thus he learned our secret, and now decide what to do with him. Enlil came up inside the boat. He took hold of my hand and brought me on board. He brought aboard my wife and made her kneel at my side. He touched our forehead, standing between us to bless us. In the past, Utanapishti was a mortal man, but now he and his wife shall become like us gods. Utanapishti shall dwell far away where the rivers flow forth. So far away they took me and settled me where the rivers flow forth. But you now who will convene for you the gods' assembly, so you can find the life you search for. For six days and seven nights come, do away without slumber. 
As soon as Gilgamesh squatted down in his haunches sleep like a fog already breathed over him, said Utanapishti to his wife, see the fellow who so desired life sleep like a fog already breathes over him, said his wife to him to Utanapishti the distant, touch the man and make him awake. The way he came back, he shall go back to well-being. By the gate he shall, <clears throat> by the gate he came forth, he shall return to his land, said Utanapishti to her, to his wife, man is deceitful, he will deceive you, go. Bake for him his daily bread loaf and line them up by his head and mark on the wall the days that he sleeps. So she baked for him his daily bread loaf. She lined them up by his head. Nothing on the wall the day that he slept. Noting on the wall the days that he slept. His first bread loaf was all dried up. The second was leathery, soggy. The third, the fourth flour cake had turned to white. The fifth had cast a mold of gray. Fresh baked was the sixth, the seventh, still on the coals. Then he touched him and the man awoke. Said Gilgamesh to him, to Utanapishti the distant, No sooner had sleep spilled over me than forthwith you touched me and made me awake. Said Utanapishti to him, to Gilgamesh, Come, Gilgamesh, count me your bread loaves. Then you will learn the days that you slept. Your first bread loaf was all dried up. The second was leathery, soggy the third. The fourth flour cake had turned to white. The fifth had cast a mold of gray. Fresh baked was the seventh, the seventh, still on the coals. And only then did I touch you. Said Gilgamesh to him, to Utanapishti the distant, O oh, Utanapishti, what should I do and where should I go? A thief has taken hold of my flesh, for there in my bedchamber death does abide, and wherever I turn, there too will be death. Said Utanapishti to him, to the boatman at Urshanabi, may the key reject you, Urshanabi, and the fairy scorn you, you who used to walk this shore, be banished from it now. As for the man that you led here, his body is tousled with matted hair, the pelts have ruined his body's beauty. Take him, into Ursh take him Urshanabi, lead him to the wash tub. Have him wash his matted locks as clean as can be. Let him cast off his pelts and the sea bear them off. Let his body be soaked till fair. Let a new kerchief be made for his head. Let him wear royal robes, the dress fitting his dignity. Until he goes home to his city, until he reaches the end of the road. Let the robes show no mark, but stay fresh and new. Wishanabi took him and led him to the wash tub. He washed his matted locks as clean as could be. He cast off his pelts and the sea bore them off. His body was soaked till fair. He made a new kerchief for his head. He wore royal robes, the dress fitting his dignity, until he goes home to his city, until he reaches the end of the road. Let the robes show no mark, but stay fresh and new. Gilgamesh and Urshanabi crewed the boat. They launched the craft and crewed it distant, and crewed it themselves, said his wife to him to Uchtan Napishti the distant. Gilgamesh came here by toil and by travail. What have you given him for his homeward journey? And Gilgamesh, he picked up a punting pole. He brought the boat back to the shore, said Uchtan Napishti to him to Gilgamesh. You came here, O Gilgamesh, by toil and by travail. What do I give you for your homeward journey? Let me disclose, O Gilgamesh, a matter most secret. To you I will tell a mystery of gods. There is a plant that looks like a box thorn. It has prickles like dog rose and it will prick one who plucks it. But if you can possess this plant, you'll be again as you were in your youth. Just as soon as Gilgamesh heard what he said, he opened a channel. Heavy stones he tied to his feet and they pulled him down to the ocean below. He took the plant and pulled it up and lifted it. The heavy stones he cut loose from his feet, and the sea cast him up from his shore. Said Gilgamesh to him, to Urshanabi, This plant, Urshanabi, is the plant of heartbeat. With it, a man can regain his vigor. To Uruk, the sheepfold, I will take it. To an ancient, I will feed. And some put, and put the plant to the test. Its name shall be Old Man Grown Young. I will eat it myself and be again as I was in my youth. At 20 leagues, they broke the bread. At 30 leagues, they stopped for the night. Gilgamesh found a pool whose water was cool. Down he went into it to bathe in the water. Of the plant's fragrance, a snake caught scent, came up in silence and bore the plant off. As it turned away, it sloughed off its skin. Then Gilgamesh sat down and wept. Down his cheeks, the tears were coursing. He spoke to Urshanabi, the boatman. For whom Urshanabi toiled my arms so hard? For whom ran dry the blood of my heart? Not for myself did I find a bounty. For the lion of earth, I have done a favor. Now far and wide, the tide is rising. Having opened the channel, I abandoned the tools. What things would I find that served as my landmark had I only turned back and left the boat on the shore? At 20 leagues, they broke bread. At 30 leagues, they stopped for the night. When they arrived in Uruk, the sheepfold said Gilgamesh to him to Urshanabi, the boatman. O Urshanabi, climb Uruk's walls and walk back and forth. Survey its foundations, examine the brickwork. Were its bricks not fired in an oven? Did the seven sages not lay its foundations? A square mile is a city, a square mile date grove, a square mile is clay pit. Half a square mile, the temple of Ishtar. Three square miles and a half is Uruk's expanse.